Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about age-related testosterone deficiency or late-onset hypogonadism. Two components to the condition. One is a low level of circulating testosterone. The other are specific kind of symptoms. And the specific symptoms have to do with sexual dysfunction. So poor morning erections or loss of sexual desire or erectile dysfunction. Those are the symptoms associated with low levels of testosterone. Now we know that in men, starting when they're in their mid-30s, the testosterone level starts to fall by about 1.5% every year. There's no clear inflection point like there is in women, so there's no equivalent to the menopause. We don't have an andropause. Andropause is not existent, at least in the age-related testosterone deficiency. So we have a condition where a lot of men have false expectations because of the ads. So the American College of Physicians and the Endocrine Society and the American Urologic Association say that testosterone supplements are inappropriate, not appropriate, to treat a decrease in cognition, a memory impairment, a lack of vitality or low levels of energy. Those kind of conditions can be caused by depression or obstructive sleep apnea or side effect of medicine or lack of physical activity or obesity. And the erectile dysfunction actually can cause from atherosclerosis, not getting enough arterial blood circulation, also be caused by treatment for hypertension, some of the beta blockers, or maybe treatment with the SSRIs, antidepressants. Well, okay, so we don't have any specific symptoms. What about a specific level of testosterone? It's not so easy. So it used to be less than 400, then it was less than 320, then it was less than 300, then it was less than 263. Now we say that if it's less than 200, less than 200 nanograms per deciliter, that's low testosterone. It's normal testosterone when it's more than 400, and it's sort of in the borderline between 200 and 400, but gets more complicated than that because there are circadian patterns of testosterone. So if you get your testosterone drawn in the morning, and it should be drawn between 8 and 10 o'clock in the morning while you're fasting, that's when your testosterone level is at the highest. It's at the lowest under normal circumstances in the afternoon. So a lot of men who go to see the doctor at 2 or 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon and have low level of testosterone at that time, no, they would have normal level of testosterone if it were done correctly in the morning. And remember, you need at least two tests on non-consecutive days in order to make the diagnosis because the tests vary significantly. And making matters more complicated, the testosterone, when it floats around in the bloodstream, the testosterone that's routinely measured, is bound to sex hormone binding globulin and is bound to albumin and some other kind of chemicals, and only about 2 to 4 percent of the testosterone is free testosterone. And actually, we don't care what the total testosterone level is. It's the free testosterone level that is important in order to make the diagnosis. So, for instance, you can have a low level of sex hormone binding globulin and then a low level of total testosterone if your blood sugar is up or if you're obese or if you drink alcohol or if you're taking steroids, if you have nephrosis, which is a kidney condition, if you have hypothyroidism, if you have a variety of other endocrine disorders. That doesn't tell you anything at all about the free testosterone, and it's the free testosterone a deficiency of which is going to lead to the symptoms. So another problem is androgen deficiency is not the same thing as erectile dysfunction. They're two completely separate conditions, and they may overlap. So as you get older, you tend to get a variety of conditions. So you could have age-related testosterone deficiency, and for other reasons, you could also have erectile dysfunction. And there is some, as I say, overlap where one the testosterone deficiency may cause the erectile dysfunction. Overwhelmingly, it doesn't. Overwhelmingly, men who are treated with the testosterone for erectile dysfunction, they don't get better. In order for them to get better, they need the Viagra or the Cialis. 
that seems to improve the condition. And if that doesn't work, then perhaps adding some of the testosterone might cause additional benefit. And we also have to realize that there are other reasons for sexual dysfunction. Have some problems inside the family, maybe you have coronary artery disease, maybe you have some difficulty sleeping, or you have diabetes, or you're a cigarette smoker, or obese, hypertension, all those kinds of things. So low testosterone is a condition that was basically manufactured by drug companies. It was manufactured by drug companies in order to sell product. They were manufacturing testosterone supplements, patches, and gels, and they wanted to sell them. And here in the United States, you can have direct-to-consumer advertising, and as a result, all of a sudden, we're bombarded with ads telling us all about this condition and how important it is. And as a matter of fact, a lot of men were treated about 20% never had any kind of a blood test. They just went to see the doctor. They said, I have these symptoms. Oh, it must be low T. So in the literature, as many as 40% of men were never tested. Well, the men had outsized expectations of what the testosterone supplements would do, how they were going to act as a fountain of youth and restore your vitality. Had all these drug awareness campaigns, oftentimes without even mentioning the drug, but the name of the hormone, testosterone, is also the name of the product. They sort of linked it to masculinity. All of a sudden, men were seeing an increased number of ads. Average man would see somewhere between four and seven ads in 2009. By 2011, it increased to uh, over 80 ads that a man would see. Now, more than one million men were tested in one time period. So advertising does indeed work. About a quarter of those men who were tested were treated. And actually, about 100,000 men were treated without even undergoing any kind of test. They lowered the bar. They made an ordinary life experience into a medical disorder. And as a result, we had a significant number of men who believed that they had a problem. As many as 10% of men who were over age 40 thought that they had low T as a medical problem when the actual number is somewhere around 0.5% or one half of 1%. So if you listen to the ads, if you read the ads, what you would think is that, oh my goodness, if I don't treat my low testosterone, and they had screening questionnaires that you could get online that the drug companies would sponsor, and almost everybody who took the test showed positive, oh, you need some therapy. Well, the idea was that if you didn't get your treatment, you were going to suffer a depressed mood and low energy, you were going to suffer from fatigue, and you were going to have muscle aches, and you were going to suffer from erectile dysfunction and infertility. The ads were a classic template for how to sell a disease. A disease. They had ghost writers who were writing articles that the lay press would carry and even some that uh, professional medical journals would carry. They sponsored CME for the doctors. They had all these campaigns. They misrepresented the research, the results of the research. And then the FDA got involved. The F DA changed the product labeling, and that's why you haven't seen any of the ads for the past six or seven years, because the FDA said, you guys are just overstating the results of what we really know. And as a matter of fact, the court said the same thing. And AbbVie, the company behind one of the products, they were fined $300 million. It was 2017. It was overturned for the most part in 2018. But the spending that the companies did to advertise the products took sales of testosterone supplements. From 1988, the testosterone supplement market was about $18 million in the United States. By 2012, it was about $2 billion. That's what advertising will do. 
And unfortunately, that's what advertising for a product that is unnecessary for the overwhelming majority of men. Now, yes, indeed, if a person does have a testosterone deficiency, a person's hypogonadal, well, you're going to have a decrease in the skeletal mass, decrease in the protein synthesis, you're going to have a problem with the lean muscle mass, you're going to have more adipose tissue, all of which can be corrected with therapy. But the question is, what is the effect of the therapy. So when you listen to the ads, you get the impression that if you use some of these testosterone supplements, you're going to have a phenomenal improvement in your life. So let's look at some of the studies. They did a series of randomized control studies, followed people for anywhere between half a year and three years. Baseline testosterone was less than 300. Men on average were about 65, 66 years of age. How much better did they get as far as the erectile function was concerned? Did their erectile dysfunction disappear? Only a small improvement. How about the global sexual functioning? Was that much better? The ad said it would be. Reality? Nope, didn't seem to work very well. What about the quality of life? Did it improve the quality of life, the vitality and the fatigue and all those? Again, nope vitality, fatigue, cognitive function, didn't even really significantly improve the fracture rate. So if you happen to take the testosterone supplements, what you should do is consider reevaluation after about a year or less and see if it really has made a difference. If it hasn't made a difference, don't continue taking the medicine. And we know that the studies clearly show that fewer than 50% of the men who start the therapy are going to continue it for just half a year because they're somewhat distressed with the lack of benefits. Now, in 2014, as a result of some medical studies we'll talk about, the Food and Drug Administration changed the labeling on the testosterone and said it's not appropriate for men who have this so-called age-related testosterone deficiency. You have to have some symptoms in addition, and the symptoms were the ones that we mentioned, the sexual function. The drug company at the same time was saying that, hey, what you should do is when you see the doctor for your yearly examination, you should just include a serum testosterone as part of your normal routine, just like a blood pressure monitoring or cholesterol or blood sugar. Organized medicine said, oh, that's not appropriate. Well, there are some contraindications. So if you look at the package insert of any of the testosterone products, it's going to say if you have breast cancer, even if you're a man, you have breast cancer, or you have polycythemia, red blood count that's relatively high, a hematocrit more than 50%, or if you have a history of prostate cancer, your PSA is elevated more than 4 If you have a nodule on digital rectal examination, or if you have severe difficulty urinating because of theoretically benign enlargement of the prostate, shouldn't take the medicine. If you desire fertility, you shouldn't take the medicine because remember, if you use testosterone supplement, it's going to decrease the sperm production. Also shouldn't take the medicine if you have obstructive sleep apnea or if you have congestive heart failure. Well, interestingly, studies done that last either less than a year or all the way to an excess of 10 years don't show any increase in death with the product, don't show any increased coronary vascular events or prostate cancer or deep vein thrombosis or even pulmonary emboli. So it would appear, at least from observational studies, that the product really doesn't seem to lead to a lot of negative consequences. And as a matter of fact, some of the studies have shown that men who take the testosterone replacement therapy have a lower risk of death than men who don't take the therapy. Well, some of the studies are really of relatively low quality and we have to be careful because some of the men who are complaining of lack of sexual desire have a different kind of disorder altogether and same thing with uh, erectile dysfunction. So, if we look at the bulk of the studies do testosterone replacements improve sexual function? And the answer is, we don't know. The answer is, the same amount of studies show 
that some men get some improvement as men don't get improvement. So the studies are sort of equal. But when the studies show that there is improvement in sexual function, the improvement is less than with the Viagra or the Cialis. Mm. So another reason to be cautious. Well, some side effects. Some side effects included acne and loss of hair and enlargement of the male breasts and worsening of the obstructive sleep apnea and an increased risk of polycythemia, too many red blood cells. Too many red blood cells might lead to some occlusion or some potential for heart attack or stroke, theoretically. And there was the worry that it would increase the size of the prostate, increase the problem with ability to urinate, increase the incidence of prostate cancer, increase the incidence of cardiovascular events, and especially because, remember, age-related testosterone deficiency occurs in older men for the most part, and those are the men who are most at risk for the cardiovascular problems. So there's always been this negative thought about testosterone that it's going to cause some cardiovascular problems. Well question is, does it really? Well, the pharmacoepidemiologic studies suggest testosterone deficiency overall might decrease the mortality rate, the all-cause mortality, and might decrease the cardiovascular mortality. So in spite of everybody telling you that it might harm the heart, it might actually seem to be associated with fewer heart-related conditions. So, what about prostate? It's difficult to say. The standard thought has always been that you need the testosterone to get the prostate cancer and the men who take the testosterone therapy are going to be at higher risk. But there's no data that links the testosterone replacement therapy to prostate cancer and close follow-up of men who are using the testosterone versus men who are not using the testosterone shows that it doesn't seem to make any difference, at least as far as the incidence of prostate cancer, doesn't seem to worsen the size of the prostate. And as a matter of fact, we have the American Urologic Association in 2019 coming out and saying that testosterone replacement therapy is safe for selected men who have prostate cancer. Now those are observational studies, they're cohort studies, and these are men with low risk, but the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York they did some studies and they say that the testosterone replacement therapy did not worsen the outcome of men who had prostate cancer, Gleason score either six or seven, that's sort of the in-between kind of prostate cancer, who had positive surgical margins and even lymph node involvement and they said that in some men who had the Gleason eight, that's more of an advanced prostate cancer, that the testosterone replacement therapy didn't seem to cause worsening. Well, what about osteopenia, osteoporosis? What's the testosterone do for the bones? It's often been said that it helps the bone. Well, we know that low testosterone is associated with low level of bone density. And what about the testosterone replacement therapy? Well, it might increase the bone mineral density, but it doesn't seem to decrease the incidence of falls and fractures. Now, the National Osteoporosis Foundation they don't make any recommendations for or against the therapy. But reports suggest that the improvement in the bone mineral density that you get from taking testosterone supplements, well, it's the same as you would get if you were taking the Fosamax or the Actinel or the Forteo or the Prolia. So, unfortunately, the studies haven't been done to show that men who are really at significant risk have fewer falls and fractures. But here's the granddaddy of the studies. Now we have two studies that came out, 2013, 2014. Both of them suggested that there was a significant increase in the risk of cardiovascular problems in men who were given hormone replacement therapy. So the first study in the Journal of the American Medical Association looked at the association of testosterone with mortality with heart attack and with stroke in men who had low testosterone. Now this was a VA study and it looked at men who had angiograms and they followed these men 
for 27 months. And if the men had low levels of testosterone and were given the supplements, they were given injections in about a third of the cases and the patches in about two-thirds of the cases. And the medicine worked. It increased the serum testosterone from an average of about 170 to about 330. But what the study showed was that cardiovascular events in the men who were receiving the testosterone therapy, about 26 percent versus only about 19.9 percent in men receiving placebo. So cardiovascular events, an absolute increase of about 6 percent. That's pretty important. And it was followed the next year in January of 2014 by an article in PLOS from UCLA and the National Cancer Institute. And what they found was that in men looking over a period of time, these were men with backward-looking study. It was a database in men in the healthcare system looking at 55,000 men. Well, what they found was the incidence of non-fatal heart attacks increased by about 36 percent in the men who were receiving testosterone. And they broke it down between men who were less than 65 and men who were over 65. Men over 65 the increase was twofold. If it was over 75, the increase was about three and a half fold. If men were less than 65 and had risk factors for heart disease, it was about a threefold increase. Now, in those men who were less than 65 who didn't have any risk factor for heart disease, didn't seem to make any difference. Now, they contrasted this with men who were taking those medicines like Viagra or Cialis, where there was no increase. So that caused the FDA to make a labeling update. Actually, they had a series of labeling updates. And they said progressively, hey, you got to be careful. Hey, the, don't take the medicine with any of the anabolic steroids that bodybuilders or weightlifters might use. But then, in February of 2020, they had a large study that came out of Kaiser in northern and southern California. And what they did is they looked at 44,000 men. It was a chart review from 1999 to 2010. And what they did is they looked at men who had low testosterone. So the overwhelming majority, 97% of the men, had low levels of testosterone in the study, less than 300. And they followed them. And about 9,000 of the men received testosterone replacement therapy. About 35,000 of the men did not receive testosterone replacement therapy. They followed them for three years. And what they found was a decrease in cardiovascular events, 33% decrease in stroke, 28% decrease in the combination of stroke and heart attack, again 28% decrease in the incidence of heart attack and sudden cardiac death and unstable angina and need for revascularization by about 34%. So what they found was that, unlike the other studies, here's a very large study that shows that actually the testosterone replacement therapy might be associated with a reduced chance of suffering some significant cardiovascular event. And they didn't find any increase in the prostate cancer. And then they reviewed that study in the Journal of the American Medical Association, and they found that if you look at just the base figures, the base figures, the men who received the testosterone had a risk of heart attack or cardiovascular events of about 10 percent, and the men who didn't receive the testosterone had about a 21 percent chance of a heart attack or a cardiovascular event. That's completely different than the study, because remember, in the study, it was about 26 percent of the men receiving the testosterone had a problem, and only a little less than 20 percent of the placebo group had a problem. So there was a big difference. Well, when you look at the death rate, unadjusted death rate, in the testosterone group, less than 6 percent. Testosterone, the not, no testosterone group, was about 9 percent. If we look at heart attacks in the testosterone group, was less than 2 percent. No testosterone group, more than 5.5 percent. So it all depends on how the figures are massaged. And when the figures are massaged, then we get almost any kind of answer we want. But it seems at least that for the overwhelming majority of older men, 
that it's a wash or an improvement if you happen to take the testosterone, at least as far as your heart's concerned. Well, how should you receive the therapy? Should you get the patch or should you get the shot? The American College of Physicians came out in 2020 and they said, hey, you go get a shot. It's a lot less expensive, only costs about $156 for the product a year. You get a shot every one to four weeks. If you get the transdermal products, cost in excess of $2,000 a year. It's no more effective. Maybe it's more convenient, but it's not more effective. So that's the story about low testosterone. It's a condition that's been hyped because of the drug companies wanting to sell a lot of their product. There's a lot of misinformation about the risks and the benefits of testosterone replacement therapy. For most men, it's not worth the hassle. It certainly isn't a cure for the decrease in sexual function, sexual desire associated with growing old. But there's a lot of overpromise on the benefit side from the drug companies, and the government appears to be exaggerating on the risk side. So does age-related testosterone levels that are deficient really require therapy? Well, if you have symptoms, not just the low level of testosterone. If you have the symptoms to boot, then it's something that may be considered. But remember, it does come with some side effects. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend. Consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new videos. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.